to know and recognise normal ultrasound anatomy to diagnose the abnormal. So the patient's lying on the table with the breasts like this, and but we're seeing a slice like this. And of course the breast consists of 15 to 20 lobes with these major lobar ducts radiating from the lactiferous situs, which is underneath the nipple. And of course each of these ducts will have a little duct, terminoductal lobular unit. And the amount of terminoductal lobular units vary in each patient. And therefore the amount of density of the breast varies. And this is the functional unit of the breast. And it's composed of the lobule and its terminal duct. And most breast pathology arises in the TDLU, such as TCIS, lobar carcinoma in situ, and fibroadenomas, and apocrine metaplasia, and adenosis. And sometimes this TDLU may actually lie up here in the cupus ligament, making differentiation of some superficial lesions difficult. So think about the anatomy as you ultrasound the breast. And the tissue will vary with the person, the age, the obesity, the hormonal status of the person, even whether they're adolescent, pregnancy, lactating, on HRT, whether they're menopausal. So basically, even when you take this breast here, which is a an average sort of a breast with um, a sort of average amount of TDLUs. We've got the dermal layer, which is the epidermal and dermal, and the breast and the hypodermal fat layer. The breast is like divided into three zones. We have the hypodermal zone, the parenchymal zone, and the retromammary zone. The actual breast itself, the breast tissue or the parenchymal tissue, are housed within the superficial fascia, which divides into the pre-mammary fascia and the retromammary fascia. And we've got these cupus ligaments which separate out the lobes and extend all the way to the chest wall. The main thing is we're looking at the anatomy within all these regions. We're looking for breaks within these fascial layers and we're trying to look at the ducts as we're scanning through. And this is particularly evident when we're looking in radial and antiradial. And this is the same with the dense fibroglandular breasts. Things can hide within these um, breasts quite easily, particularly the smaller cancers and all the diffuse cancers. And it's the diffuse cancers which I will show you that we can pick up by trying to recognise all these ducts going through the areas of all the interlobular fat. Here we have a breast feeding patient. And what's happened here, we have the pre-memory fascia which is being pushed up and opened out at the cupus ligament. And we've got the um, ducts all pushing their way up, milk-filled ducts. This particular patient presented with a lump under the armpit, which we sometimes see, of course, when someone's pre pregnant or lactating. And this was actually accessory breast tissue. But even here, we've got ductal tissue within the actual um, accessory breast tissue. Fatty, involuted breasts. Sometimes in those, of course, as I said before, the TDLU can lie right up within the cupus ligament. And often with the fatty breasts, fibroadenomas or cancers can actually um, camouflage quite easily. TSO, which is a um, tissue specific optimization, which is on your touch screen of your Toshibas, is great for optimizing fatty breasts. But once again, we're looking for the ducts as we're scanning through. We're looking at the pre mammary fascia and the cupus ligaments and the retromammary fascia. And of course, we are, we'll identify some of these lesions can, which can be camouflaging in between. And of course, this one is eating through the pre mammary fascia. Or even these areas which are shadowing. This is a very large breast, and this was not seen on the mammogram. But we can see this area of shadowing, and of course, shadowing can come off cupus ligaments. But when we're looking at this, we can see there's these ducts which have been bitten away, and then they're starting up again on the other side. So Stavros and Rosen have given us some things that we look for with malignant findings. We look for speculation and angular margins and microlobulation and circumscribed masses. And most breast cancers will start off taller than wide rather than wider than tall because they'll start at the end of the TDLU and migrate down and they can go across unless of course they start in the terminal ductal lobule at the end here. And of course, larger breast cancers can be wider than tall. Most breast cancers we always thought were hypoechoic, but liposarcomas and breast metastases from melanomas can be hyperechoic. 
Some can be isoechoic, and these are the cancers that are harder to see it. Or even the anechoic ones, which tend to be the more aggressive cancers, can hide amongst cysts. Calcifications is an area we're getting much better at. Of course, you'll have benign calcifications when someone's surgery, but it's the actual recurrence that we're looking for, these little speculated micro calcifications, which I will show you. A lot of breast cancers shadow. However, we're realising the more aggressive breast cancers will enhance. We're looking for branching patterns and duct extension and the desmoplastic reaction, and I'll describe this all. But the main thing is, is the disruption through the tissue planes and the fact that the cancer is retractive and pulls the tissue with it. It's non-elastic and it's firm. So we're going to show you how to test all these. Breast cancers tend not to be mobile. Ultrasound has the advantage of being a dynamic, real-time thing. So we can use our advantages over MRI and mammography. And of course, we're going to use low flow settings of 2 to 5 cms per second because the actual branches of blood vessels in cancers are very small and compressible. The desmoplastic reaction is the response by the body to wall off the tumour with fibrosis and elastosis. This is a very exaggerated desmoplastic reaction. It's a bit like when someone's had an implant put in their breast and they make a fibrous ca um, capsule. It's the body trying to wall it off. And the reason that the body can do this is because these cancers are developing slower. They tend to be your grade 1 or grade 2. We've even got a mild desmoplastic reaction around here. These cancers also can tend to be um, speculated masses, and that's a form of desmoplastic reaction. You can see the, the desmoplastic reaction around here, and you can see the speculated masses. And they tend to shadow, and of course the grade 1 and particularly the grade 2 breast cancers are the most common types of cancers. They tend not to be as vascular, but often we'll see vascularity. However, the aggressive cancers, unfortunately, are the more circumscribed masses and they don't have desmoplastic reaction because it grows too fast for the desmoplasia to develop. And this is an inflammatory response with lymphocytes and plasma cells. They tend to have posterior enhancement, so they tend to mimic your benign lesions and they're more vascular. This top one looked very much like a fibroadenoma until we tested it with the probe tilt method coming from one side and it dragged the tissue with it and then we rotated on it and saw that there were speculated edges coming out. This particular one was sitting in a breast full of cysts and of course you can see that it's an abnormal looking cyst. We've put low flow settings on, we've got a vascular stalk. Both were aggressive grade 3 cancers. So here we have the one that looked a bit like a fibroadenoma and we can see these speculated edges and it actually has a colour stalk going to it. However, not all cancers will look like a mass and some are diffuse. Some are bigger than the probe and you can't actually differentiate it out. And this is when you have to look for the normal anatomy to diagnose the abnormal. This particular patient had had breast cancer at 10 o'clock in the right breast. And Working with the radiologist, we could see that there was an area that we were of interest at 4 o'clock. As I'm going through, I'm trying to identify the actual um, ducts, and we can see a bit of a duct here, but then it's discontinued. And then we're picking up ducts again over here. Also in real time, you could appreciate these little microcalcifications. This is the area that we're looking at here. This over here is where the breast cancer surgery was done, and this is a fibroadenoma in the other breast. So coming through here, we can see that these ducts from another view are discontinued as they're going through here. At the end of the actual scar tissue, we had a non-cancerous area, but this was confirmed on biopsy to be a breast cancer. Toshiba has this tool, which is called MicroPure, which is a tool to detect for our microcalcifications and hopefully this is going to help us a lot more so that we can um, use the um, MicroPure to detect DCIS and it may reduce the need for stereotactic biopsy because we can be assured that we're actually seeing the same lesion that they're seeing on um, with microcalcification on mammogram. And of course it's easier to biopsy under ultrasound guidance. The patient position may be varied throughout the scan. Generally, we'll um, have the patient rolled with the side scan being raised and the nipple forming the centre of a clock face. And that ipsilateral arm will be raised if possible. 
ultimately we're needing to flatten out that area of breast that we're scanning as thinly as possible. So be prepared to optimise for the area being scanned. This is particularly when we're targeting lesions or in these large breasts which come up under the chin or are pendulous over the abdomen. With those particular breasts, sometimes you'll need to have the medial lesions or the medial side uh, with the patient's supine or even rolling onto the side of interest. If it's on the lateral side, you may need to raise the side as far as decubitus. With superior large breasts, on the superior aspect of the breast, you may need to partially or fully sit. And the inferior part of the breast, the patient may need to be supine or even may need to assist by holding up the breast or be in a Trendelenburg position. I always scan from out to in, so that stops the tissue drag from bringing the breast from the nipple out. The degree of obliquity depends on the breast size and the location of the lesion. Now with these second look ultrasounds, particularly when we're trying to target a lesion, you may even need to look in the mammo position and find and be assured that you're seeing the same lesion they're seeing whilst they're in the craniocaudal and then gradually sit the, lie the patient down ready for biopsy. You may even need to image the position where the patient feels the lump and of course it may be actually normal benign tissue. The technical points, it, basically how you survey doesn't matter if you do long and trans or radial or anti-radial. The important thing is, is that it's a systematic scan and you're doing quadrant by quadrant. I tend to teach my students to do trans and uh, long initially, quadrant by quadrant, and overlapping about a third of the probe. And again, scanning from out to in. However, we will image all the o'clock positions from 1 to 12 in a radial um, position. However, if we see a lesion, we will always image and measure the mass in two orthogonal planes, but including the longest length. So in this case, if we were just continuing on in radial, the um, lesion would only measure at 16, 17 millimetres. However, once we've turned trans and then anti-radial, of, of course it's 23 by 22. And that's going to really affect the actual staging of the breast cancer. So be aware that you always should take the longest axis of the tumour. That's what the pathologist is going to do when they're grading or staging the breast cancer. And bearing in mind, 2 to 5 cm's is, um, with that plus or minus armpit nodes, is a stage 2. And we want to see these lesions at stage 1 or less. Here we have a lady who has a 5 centimetre lesion, a 50 millimetre lesion, and that brings her into stage 3. And then you will see later that she had multiple nodes, which I will use. Cancer cell grading is what the pathologist sees under the microscope. So grade 1 are the lower grade ones and the cancer cells look very much like normal breast cells so they tend to be the slower growing ones. And grade 2 are the ones that most breast cancer sit in and they look more abnormal and grow slightly faster. However the grade 3, as I've already said, tend to look very abnormal and they grow and spread faster and these tend to be the younger patients or the more aggressive inflammatory cancers. So here we have the ones that tend to be in your grade 1, 2 region and these invasive cancers often can be amongst the grade 3. But don't forget the metastases. I've seen metastases from melanomas and ovarian cancers to the breast. Inflammatory cancers are a rare form of breast cancer and they mimic mastitis. It's a rapid onset and suddenly the breast may turn red and you may think the person's got mastitis with arrhythmia and breast enlargement. And they tend to have this skin peau d'orange, orange peel effect. And they may not even have a um, mass and they may not be tender. But they'll have this thickened skin and this diffuse looking breast cancer. So usually the patient will do chemo, uh, the doctor will do chemo before surgery. So the scan must include the whole breast to the chest wall covering the nipple and the retroareolar region, the axillary tail and the axillary levels 1, 2 and 3. We scan all axillary levels, even post mastectomy, on the side of the mastectomy. Our surgeons actually require this. 
And if any of these are abnormal, we will then go on, go on to the supraclavicular nodes. So what are the axillary nodes? Axillary level one are the ones in the armpit, which most people do, and they're the ones lateral to the pec major and pec minor and deep to the superficial fascia. And you'll see the lymph nodes sitting under here. But you must scan the left breast from the axilla all the way down to three to four o'clock, and the same with the right down to nine o'clock. The actual axillary level extends all the way down there. Level two are deep to pec major and pec minor. And you can actually identify the um, normal nodes in a fatty breast, a person with or an older patient, because they tend to have a fatty hilus. Level three is more medially near the actual sternum, and I scan these with the patient's arm up, but you may like to vary it during the scan. And they are actually where the pec minor has dissipated out. Rotus nodes are those nodes that are in between. Don't forget the intramammary nodes as well. And you'll sometimes see these amongst the breast, but they have that nice sort of cortical appearance. Here we have a, the 49-year-old female who had that 5-centimetre breast cancer. So here we have the pec major and we've got an abnormal axillary level 1 node, but we've also got an abnormal axillary level 2 node. Coming more medially, her axillary level 3 nodes are normal. But we've scanned all the way down to about 4 o'clock and she has also an abnormal node out at 4 o'clock. Now this in some patients may be the first node, it may be the sentinel node. So that's why it's important to go down the side of the breast. And don't forget the sternal nodes, the internal nodes here. Now this can be covered when you're just doing your long position, scanning here in long from the sternum in as you're doing those quadrants on the inner half. And this particular lady had abnormal sternal nodes. This is the costal cartilage, we're in long, and we can see these abnormal nodes. And SMI is a very nice way of um, detecting low colour flows, and that's another tool that Toshiba has for us. Normal sternal nodes can be seen, so here we have a normal one, we've got the costal cartilage and in between the sternum we can see the normal nodes sitting in here. And you can actually identify the echogenic hilus. So how do we work out if it's an abnormal lymph node? Well there's been lots of literature and some people would do a 2 to 1 ratio long to width, height. However, it's not always so, because we know that fatty nodes can be rounded. Some would measure the cortical thickness, and they would use three millimetres as the maximum. It's more probably what the actual cortex looks like and what is happening in that lymph node. When the cancer comes in, it comes through the afferent channels, like the cortex of a kidney, and it feeds in and lock, the cancer will lock on here or here. So of course you may get some eccentric cortical thickening. And in this case we've got two that have locked in, one say here and one here. So we've got indentations of the hilus. Then gradually as it grows and um, encroaches on the cortex, you might get a slit-like hilum or even rounding and hilum displacement or even absent hilum. These are the easier ones to pick up. It's the differentiation of these that are hard. And then eventually it will invade outside. So here we have a normal lymph node sitting below the fascia. You won't have them in this fatty area. It's got to be below the superficial or deep to the superficial fascia. So be, make sure that you're actually looking deep enough. Here we have rounded nodes, but that's because they've got a central echogenic fatty hilus. And here we have an malignant node with an eccentric cortical thickening. So we've got a little bit of thickening here. Here is the normal cortex. And when we put the colour on, we have messy vascular branching. And this is where SMI can be very handy. And of course, the vascularity will tend to go more to the actual periphery as well. It will be disorganised flow. Here we have an example of the indentations. So we've got multiple areas coming in. On the, here's the normal part of the cortex. And here we have some rounded nodes and a slit-like hilum. Here we have absent hilum, and then of course this is in actually the 
auxiliary level two nodes where we've got invasion. And it's a no wonder when someone has affected nodes in the level two or three, this is very, very close to the subclavian vein. So of course they'll probably get um, swelling of the um, arm on that side. And this is a pec major, pec mitre, and it has invaded up. We've often seen this with recurrence with mastectomies. But don't forget the normal inflammatory node. This 21-year-old female came to, with a left breast ultrasound for a lump at 4 o'clock, which was identified on the outer, just outside the breast tissue, to be a lymph node. When you actually went further up, there was a whole group of them. And what is happening here is this girl actually has an infected belly ring, and this actually drains to the outer part of the auxiliary area as well, as well as to the groin. So beware, it may be an inflammatory node from an infected belly ring. So how do we differentiate malignant nodes from inflammatory? You can't always. However, mostly malignant nodes will have uneven thickened cortices. They'll have an incomplete, poor, poorly differentiated capsule. So it could get a little bit fuzzy around the edges. And then they'll have messy, disorganised branching vascularity and also it will go to the periphery like this. However, the inflammatory nodes will have even thickened cortex, complete thin capsule, and it will have organised increased, vascu increased vascularity extending from the hilus. It won't extend out to the periphery. So the sentinel node is the node or nodes through which the cancer will first pass. And we now do the sentinel lymph node biopsy. And we're trying to avoid auxiliary lymph node dissection and removal of all the lymph nodes like they used to do. And this is to avoid the problems that are associated with that, like lymphedema or even seromas in that cancer. This um, post-surgery, it won't drain as well if all the lymph nodes are removed. So what they do before the surgery, the surgeon will generally hit in Australia, the nuclear medicine, will inject a small dose of isotope and blue dye, and usually it's around the areola tissue. Some people will elect to be in the region of the tumour. And they'll wait about 30 to 40 minutes and the patient will have a nuclear scan. And it will say when it's ready the actual isotope has passed to, from the cancer to the sentinel node. Often the sentinel node's about here in the auxiliary tail. So the actual surgeon can use a radioactive counter, a bit like a Geiger counter, to locate that sentinel node during surgery. And the blue dye will assist it. They will have it looked at pathologically during the operation or maybe after the operation. And if it's abnormal, they may then continue on and remove more nodes. This is why it's important for us to diagnose abnormal nodes first, because you may help that patient from coming back for a second, second operation if you've already worked out that there, is, that there is abnormal nodes. With documentation, it's consistent, should be consistent amongst your practice to ensure accurate and correlation and follow-up. Of course, we can label the site and the o'clock position and where we are. The main thing is, is always measure in CMs from the nipple with a ruler. Don't just estimate and don't just say, oh, this is probe depth. If there's more than one lesion and if these lesions are close, because we're always looking for multiple lesions if we've found one, you may like to measure the distance between these lesions because sometimes the surgical option may be to do a wide breast excision from one cut. Always correlate with the mammogram and understand the triangulation of breast lesions. Compare with previous ultrasounds. Don't just look at the radiology report, look at the previous ultrasounds and palpate any lumps with the patient's permissions. I insist that my students take their mammograms and previous worksheets into the ultrasound room. Um, you may need to refer to it during the scan. Now basically with the triangulation of breast lesions, because the MLO is done with a sloping down oblique technique, it's easy on the craniocaudal to say if something's medial or lateral, but with medial lesions on the patient it will appear lower on the MLO and lateral lesions will appear higher. So you can see it nicely here, these lesions on the lateral side will tend to appear a little bit higher on the medial lateral oblique and the medial lesions will appear marginally lower just so you can work out your triangulation. 
So technically we're using multiple patient positions when we're looking at a mass or probe angles or orientation. And when the indication is a palpable lump, palpate it while you're scanning. You can roll a finger under the probe with a standoff or lots of gel. And it can help actually differentiating if it's an actual mass or normal fibroglandular tissue. But be prepared to change from default settings. Toshiba machines are often very good to use DIFF2, the most modern machines, or even PS for cystic lesions. Ensure your focus is correct and be prepared to go to a lower frequency if needed. You may even like to decrease your dynamic range if you have these fatty breasts or TSO is brilliant for those. I like to have AppliPure set at about 5 and Precision set at about 6. That will vary on what you like to look at, but you can even change that. AppliPure is your compounding. Precision is your um, noise reduction and sharpening of edge lesions. Using low flow settings of 2 to C um, and don't forget SMI for this. So I'm going to show you some examples. When we're scanning, it's a mixture of compression and light-handed scanning. This particular lady came to us and she had a very small lesion of about 4 millimetres at about 2 o'clock in the left breast. And the student went over this region about 4 or 5 times and couldn't find it. I've given her a bit of a hand by using compression in that region. So it's very important not to have the breast so that it's too floppy. Um, otherwise you will miss these lesions and you often need compression. However, when you're using colour, you don't want to compress too hard because of the compressibility of these very fine vessels within the lesion. Here we have non with compression and non-compression. We've also lowered our flow settings to two. And we can see colour flow. Here's another example of compression off and compression on with colour flow settings. And we've got the same colour flow settings, but there's abnormal vascularity here. And these were all proven cancers. Stavros talks about velotment. If you see things in ducts, it may be mobile secretions or inspissated secretions. So you'd like to bounce on the lesion. And particularly if they're mobile, you might like to try and move the secretions to see if there's an underlying papilloma or DCIS. In this particular case, we actually had a patient with DCIS. You may like to roll the patient to see if there's some mobile fluid. In this particular one, we have a fat fluid layer. And this is because this is a galactoseal. And the um, fat is higher and the um, sort of milky product is lower. However, galactoseals, of course, which are milk-filled cysts, usually in women who are lactating, um, can be echogenic or they can be hypochoic. It depends on the actual quantity of fat within that milk. Here we have a person with insipidated secretions. So we'll be bouncing on this cyst, but we will also rotate on them to see if we can um, have mobile product within that cyst or if there's any speculations. This particular lady had had a breast reduction about six months before. And this actually isn't her photo, but she had redness sitting here underneath the scar for a breast reduction. And of course, we naturally thought that she was going to have an abscess. And this very much looked like an abscess sitting here. But we rolled the patient and put on low flow settings and we can see this strong vascular stalk. And this unfortunately was a very invasive inflammatory breast cancer. So use the ultrasound advantage of dynamics and test the compressibility. Elastography can be used if you're fortunate enough to have it. However, we can use the probe to test the compressibility. If we tilt from over here on this particular cancer, this will drag the tissue with it. With the cyst, you will see it's sliding and the actual tissue around it will be pushed out. It won't be eaten through like these little ducts here. And here we have a cyst with hemorrhage, which we can use belotment on and see that it's actually mobile. This particular one was in a lady with multiple breast cysts. We're wondering, she had a breast cancer in her left breast. Um, we're looking at this here, and we can see that it's solid. So we've had a look and turned and rotated and compressed. And we can see that it's got speculated edges. And this ended up being a proven breast cancer. While compressing, look at the surrounding tissue effects. So benign lesions will push away the fascial layers like the pre-mammary fascia or the ducts. Malignant lesions like these, and this is a lady with multiple breast cancers, will disrupt through the layers. 
So here we have the pre-memory fascia, we have breast ducts here in a rather thin patient and it's eating through the pre-memory fascia. It may look obvious here now that we've worked it up, but these lesions weren't necessarily Sorry, I just had a computer error. These lesions weren't necessarily um, seen easily initially. Fibroadenomas will tilt with that or slide with very pro-compression. Malignant lesions don't. Benign findings are smooth and circumscribed and absent of any malignant findings, they can be ellipsoid in shape and they tend to be parallel to the skin wider than tall, with three or fewer gentle lobulations. The malignant lesions will eat through, and we can see this one's eating through the pre-memory fascia. They, the benign lesions have this thin, complete echogenic capsule. Malignant lesions won't have the complete, they'll have an incomplete capsule. And benign lesions won't have any disruption to the tissue players, planes, they will compress out. If we're trying to differentiate fat lobules versus fibroadenomas, fat lobules compress more and they also have a facile line sign running through them. With this particular lady who was a follow-up fibroadenoma, we came from the side here and looked from a different approach and then rotated and you can see the continuous fat. Unlike this one which is complete and, never, and it will always be a fibroadenoma as you rotate. Whilst compressing, look at the surrounding tissue effects. Hematomas are soft and can be pushed out of shape with the non-probe hand. So I'm often using the non-probe hand. They also have a capsule. Now what are hematomas? They're fibroadenolipomas. So they're made of normal breast tissue in an abnormal form. So hematomas of course appear in lots of organs, glandular organs, and they're made of that tissue's organs tissue but in an abnormal way. This particular hematoma had been previously described as two fibroadenomas. So always look at the big picture, look for the capsule. We can see the capsule coming all the way around here and this was the capsule which we would then work up and magnify much more. This particular lady was a 53 year old female with saline implants and she'd had nothing seen on the mammogram. She had previously described multiple cysts and fibroadenomas and her last scan was three years before. I've got her at 4.45 and I've seen that she's got this hematoma looking lesion sitting at 12 o'clock. Then I go around and think, oh yes, she's got a few small cysts at 2 o'clock. She's got an intramammary lymph node here and what may be a fibroadenoma around at 3 o'clock. But then we get around to 7 o'clock and you can see this tiny little lesion biting through the pre-memory fascia with a small amount of desmoplastic reaction which we've worked up and magnified. Then we get around to 9 o'clock and we can see this larger lesion which has gone right through that pre-memory fascia with a bit of a microlobulation of the edge and microcalcifications. Then we get to 10 o'clock and again we're seeing more lesions coming out at 8 centimetres from the nipple and then another one at 10 o'clock at 3 centimetres from the nipple. So we've gone off to the lymph nodes and we've got abnormal lymph nodes. So beware, make sure it doesn't, you may not have seen it on the mammogram. So it's not just targeting these days. So magnify and rotate on lesions. We're looking for angular margins and speculation. Always magnify small lesions to look for a surrounding tissue effects such as desmoplasia and retraction and invasion. So we're rotating on this small lesion and we're going to magnify it up and rotate and even approach from another angle. If it's there, it will, will never disappear. And here we have used SMI or low flow scale settings to see the actual colour flow within that lesion or go into that lesion. Of course, it wasn't seen on the large breast. Compression and altered approach can eradicate shadowing from fibrous breast scars or cupis ligaments. We've gone through this lady's breast and it looks like there could be something sitting down here, but we haven't seen the tissue properly. 
So I've actually used a two-handed technique where I've actually made the breast almost poke up with the second hand and come across and notice that it's actually just a normal cyst. Here we have another one uh, where the gain should be set at a medium grey. Initially this looks a bit like a large cyst and when we have the actual gain or use TSO we can see that this is a lobulated cancer. And always make sure that you see the chest wall. Um, this particular patient, it looks like we can't see through it and we're wondering if we've got a breast cancer. We've lowered the frequency on that probe and we can see that it's a fibroadenoma. And we can see on another patient with the invasion of a multiple lesions going up into the Cooper's ligaments. This is a form of branching pattern. This same lady had multiple lesions throughout her breast. This particular lady was a 42-year-old female who came for a routine mammogram and she had, was just coming for her general screening. So always look for multifocal. We've started at 12 o'clock and we're seeing this small lesion sitting here. Then around at 2 o'clock we've got these two lesions which I'd shown before. These are the sort, if they were on their own, you may like to measure the distance between. And then we've come around to 3 o'clock and we can see another lot of lesions biting through the fascial layers. So all these are lesions, multiple, she had at least six breast cancers within the same breast. And then we're working each of them up. This particular lady came and she was an identical twin of a triplet and her twin had had breast cancer. Now she had been refused biopsy nine months before because the sonographer felt she couldn't see um, anything in her breast. She just had breath, dense breast tissue. On mammogram she had pure white out breast. What I'm seeing here is that I can't identify the tissue. I can see ducts here, I can see ducts here, but I can't identify breast tissue through here. So I've actually changed machines and then used precision and applipure and use compression and you can see a spiculating lesion. So we've worked it from this to eventually this and we've got a large breast cancer. Large breast lesions, especially in these large breast, dense breasts, can camouflage. So look for the normal anatomy to see the abnormal. Sometimes these lesions are bigger than the probe size. So you can naturally, if you're just thinking shades of grey and white, you're going to miss large breast cancers. With these, you can see there's a large breast lesion sitting here and how are we identifying it? Well one, the pre-mammary fascia has been disrupted. We've got a bit of necrosis here. We've got disrupted ducts coming through here and we can see that these disrupted ducts are coming all the way around these fascia layers. Sometimes you may like to use a wide view or panorama which is a wonderful technique and just requires a little bit of practice. Be prepared to change to a lower frequency. You must check penetrate to the chest wall. This looks like a granulomatous tissue. And again, we've lowered the frequency and we've come from above, but we still can't see below. Uh, we haven't penetrated through the lesion. So we've actually gone to a 9 megahertz probe. And once we've gone to a 9 megahertz probe, we can actually see the desmoplastic reaction around. Ultrasound, of course, is performed supine, so it's going to make things look like they're affecting the chest wall. Unlike MRI, which is done prone, and mammogram, which pulls the breast away from the chest wall. So sometimes you may need to actually rotate the patient. We've rotated them and realised that that lesion, which looked like it was going right into the pectoral muscle, isn't actually doing it. And this can help with the patient planning for surgery. Trying to differentiate superficial breast lesions. What we're trying to do here is differentiate those lesions like epidermoid cysts and sebaceous cysts and things that appear in the hypodermal or epidermal layer from those which are extending up from the TDLU. Now this may sound basic but sometimes they look like they're actually um, within the hypodermal layer but they're actually extending up from the lower level and they're actually breast cancers. Lesions can be classed if as dermal if they are completely within the dermis like this sebaceous cyst or if there's a tract extending from the lesion to the skin. However, if you look at the anatomy and use a standoff or lots of gel, you can see this echogenic claw line come, or claw sign coming around. 
unlike the cancers which won't have the claw sign, you have actually disrupted and eaten through the actual mammary fascia. And these are best scanned, of course, with a standoff or a lot of gel acting as a standoff. So what do we see sometimes within the um, breast, in the hypodermal layer, we can see a calcified oil cyst. We, here we have an example of an ingrown hair within the areola region. Here we have fat necrosis within the hypodermal layer, but this unfortunately is actually extending through the layers and this was actually a melanoma metastasis. I must admit this actually felt different to this fat necrosis. It was actually firmer and the lady did have a history of melanoma. There is a condition called Mondo's thrombophobitis that people can get. It's a rare condition. It is self-limiting. The important thing is, is being able to diagnose what it is. It appears in the hypodermal layer and it is actually in the veins of the actual breast. And of course, like any thrombophobitis, we'll just follow it until we get to a patent vein and that will prove that it's actually a venous thrombus. Here we have a lipoma and it's actually in a very involuted breast. Here is her breast parenchyma and it's in the hypodermal layer. And why are lipomas echogenic in breasts whereas they're hypocoic in other regions? And that's because of the acoustic impedance mismatch between the fat within the hypodermal layer and the actual lipoma. Please don't ignore behind the nipple. Stavros has done a lot about discharge and changes. He's said about having a warm room and warm gel and using a light hand and no compression because the ducts are soft and the vessels are small. So we're looking at people like this with um, people who have nipple changes or are excreting something and these are examples of people with pagets of the breast. So try and look at the nipple to see if you can work out where the discharge is coming from. And you're going to look for all the ducts under the nipple, but ultimately what we want to be is not vertical to the ducts, we want to be parallel to them. And we want to avoid the shadowing from the nipple. Most of us, I think, will look from above and then we'll do this peripheral compression technique. And it's really, really good at trying to get parallel to these ducts. But if we really want to see what's happening straight under the nipple, he will sometimes use this two-handed compression technique. And I've used this technique even mid-breast with normal breast tissue trying to get underneath scars to try and see underneath that scar tissue. Sometimes, and this is what Stavros says is the best method, is using the rolled nipple technique. And this is when you really can't identify what's going on underneath that duct under that nipple and we're seeing that the duct is actually parallel to the chest wall now. Here we have a 67 year old with an episode of bleeding from the nipple and we're fortunate here she's got a bit of fluid in her lactiferous sinus and we have a papilloma. But they're not always exact or so obvious. Here we have a 25 year old with a papilloma lump just above the nipple. So what are we going to do? We're going to try and see if this is a fibroadenoma or a papilloma. It's been proven to, under a biopsy to be a papilloma. But what we did was work up the fluid into the duct by rolling the lesion under the nipple, under the finger, under our own finger, and then we can see the duct extending back to the nipple. This particular girl had nipple discharge and she was 19. We're thinking initially that this is inspissated secretions. So we can see these actual ducts emanating out from underneath the nipple, but we're seeing multiple microcalcifications, and unfortunately this was a breast cancer. The post-surgical breast is probably the most challenging part, and um, ultimately we're looking for recurrence and new breast cancer pathologies. And of course, most breast cancer uh, scars will have some form of seroma. This is an exaggeration of seroma, but they're our friend because we can use the seroma to look at the tissue around. Unfortunately, the images can be confused with granulomas, all those oily cysts, or fat necrosis, or even fibrotic scarring. Or we may be looking for hemorrhage or hematomas, even old hematomas. But ultimately, we're looking for recurrence and new cancers. So when we're looking at a surgical scar, always compare with the previous images to note any changes. 
Use your clinical acumen and also compression to, f to find this, define the sharp, smooth edges of the scar or the irregular, ill-defined edges that you may see with recurrence. So we're going to try and work up this scar. So while we're looking at this scar, we'll come from above but continue looking at that region of the scar and rotate slowly around while we're watching the scar. We can even use our second hand on the breast tissue on the opposite side to the probe. If the probe's coming from this side, we may use our second hand to rub the tissue over itself. And that will help bring up the scar um, seroma part. I'll show you on the next slide. And then we apply colour. The scar should not have colour. So coming on to the next slide, we're working up to this. We've come from above and we're trying to have a look and then we're rotating and moving the scar on itself. And eventually we can see this lovely defined scar coming all the way up to the chest wall. Here we have another one, which was two years post wide breast excision. And this looks like a recurrent breast cancer. So we want to see what's going on in this scar. So we'll move from above and angle down and then we'll use our second hand approach and we're defining this nice seroma here. This is just an inflammatory change within a normal scar. Here we have granulomatous change but normal change within a scar tissue and sometimes you'll see those oily cysts. But here we have a lady with recurrence. This particular one, we're working with the radiologist. The radiologist has, has seen some microcalcifications in this region. And this is where tomosynthesis has been an absolute gem, but it's actually making us work harder to try and work out what they have seen. The actual scar was at 12 o'clock, but when you went and looked under the breast, it actually tracked across to 2 o'clock. And at the end of the scar was this little area here with these small microcalcifications going through. And this was proven to be recurrence of breast cancer. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes recurrence will just look like your normal breast cancer with a de desmoplastic reaction like this one and a strong colour stalk. Here we have another lady who had breast cancer in 1994 at 48 years. Now this lady refuses any therapy and she's very fortunate this is a very slow growing breast cancer. Um, this is a recurrence. She's had surgery here and initially I could identify this cancer, one by feeling it and two by looking and identifying the missing ducts. And this has gradually progressed over time. This is in 2014. So with this particular case, because this, this is a camouflaging lesion, yes, we're looking for the anatomy, but you can see from here to here, I've actually used a bit more compression and lowered the dynamic range. And we can actually appreciate with probe movement that this was actually a solid lesion. And this is proven recurrence. So in conclusion, think about the ultrasound anatomy while you're scanning. Correlate the anatomy to the ultrasound and the mammogram and think about the patient's clinical history and age. Try and answer the doctor's clinical question and know the possible pathologies and their appearances. Look, there are many other pathologies I haven't had time to go through tonight and particularly not implants. That may have to be another talk. But understand your machine and don't be afraid to change your settings to optimise and be prepared to optimise the breast position. Take time to work up your areas of suspicion. I'd like to thank the sonographers of the MIA Eastern Region of Victoria for their contribution of cases to this presentation.